please, uh, would you allow me, on your behalf, to pray with our pastor today? Father in heaven, thank you so much that uh, we have the privilege of hearing from our treasurer of our conference. We just ask that you would uh, be with him as he speaks with us today. Thank you for the message that you have already given him. And may it be a blessing to our hearts today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Okay, I don't know if you can. Good morning. Good morning. And happy Sabbath to all of you. Yeah, I don't know if uh, you have the slide that I gave you. Yeah, there you go. Thank you so much. You know, before I uh, get started, thank you, Pastor, for praying for me. One thing he neglected to tell you also um, is that my sister, I mean my wife, sister's sister-in-law, is married to your uh-huh. uncle. So when I, yeah, so when I, so, yeah, it just so happens. <laughs> so when I, you know, when we, yeah, when we hired uh, Pastor Stevenson to come to the conference, I was like, this name sounds familiar. So I immediately called, you know, my sister-in-law, and I, and I said, uh, you know, is he related to Stanley? Stanley is his uncle. And they immediately recognized that, yeah, he's, he's my nephew. So we have a little bit of family relation uh, also. So amen for that. You know, one of the things, um, you know, I'm from Puerto Rico, but I consider myself a citizen of the world uh, in many respects. Um, and I can prove it to you. You know, one of the things that I, that I like and enjoy, it's I like history. You know, I like uh, knowing the past. So when, you know, it's very popular today to get your DNA test. So I went out and got my sample, and I also gifted my parents with, with the same, same opportunity. And when I got my results, I am literally a citizen of the world. You know, I have, I have background from Spain, Portugal. Uh, well, you will not believe this one, Irish. Oh, yeah. 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 I also have um, from uh, African continent, and then I also have Native American. So I am a citizen of the world. That's the way I, that's the way I see myself. And I, I feel in our conference has a great ethnic variety. You know, it's one of the things that I really enjoy. I, when I have the opportunity to come and be treasurer of this conference in May 2016, one of the, thing, the things I realized is that our conference is basically a small general conference. Correct. All parts of the world are represented in our territory. So I feel like I fit very well uh, in our conference uh, because of my, my ancestry. But it's a pleasure to be here with you today. And one more thing I want to say before we get into the sermon. You know, one of the things, uh, I wasn't always working for the church. You know, so I, I was what they call a lay person. You know, I used to work in the business world. But when I was growing up, you know, I always remember my dad was a minister, my mom was an educator. It's kind of my background. And from a very early age, my dad, when he would give me a dollar, you know, he would always say, 10 cents is your tithe. You know, and I would have three different cans or three different banks, you know, in my bedroom. And he would say, 10 cents is your tithe, 10 cents is your offering and the other 80 cents is for you, you know, and then you can do whatever you want with that. And as I got older, I remember my grandmother, who only had an elementary school education, and she would get a social security check. I remember she would call me, she would, she would, in Spanish, we have terms of endearment for names, so she would call me Orbilito, you know, when you're small, they use that, that ending. So she would say, Orbilito, I wanna show you something, and she would get her social security check, and she would show me in the small amount that she was getting how she would separate her tithe for the Lord mm-hmm. you know, and her offering. And then she and my grandfather, you know, they both had social security checks, would live on the rest. So even when I wasn't working for the church, it was instilling me to always be faithful to the Lord. Mm-hmm. You know, and as I have the opportunity now you know, to be treasurer uh, of a conference, and I see these funds that arrived there, I see the numbers, you know, I don't get to touch the dollars, like you said, but I see the numbers. You know, for me, it's always a recognition that there's many people in our territory that are being faithful to the Lord. Mm-hmm. You know, and as I look at you and have the opportunity to share with you today, I just want to thank you, not because you're faithful to the church, you know, or faithful to the conference or to the general conference, but that you have developed an intimate relationship with the Lord, and it is because of that that you are worshiping Him to do the tithe and offerings. So I just want to thank you for what you do. And I see the results, you know, like he's saying, when we get to the office and we have the opportunity to pass this money back out uh, to each of our churches, the pastors, ministers, evangelism, 
and different things that we do as a conference, you know, I personally see a conference having a rebirth. Amen. It's the way I see it. Amen. You know, when I arrived to this conference, I don't want to spend too much time on that, but when I arrived to this conference, you all know that there's been a lot of history with land, issues with land, uh, dead, you know, and by the Lord's grace, since I've been here, we've been able to eliminate about $5 million worth of debt uh, for a conference. So I'm glad to say, tell you that. And also we've had the opportunity, you may have seen some articles through the recorder, that we've been able to also go back to churches and give them some monies that have been promised, in some cases back to 1995, uh, for construction projects and different things like that. So I just say, praise the Lord, that through you and through other things that are happening in our conference, He's providing the resources and means so that the work can continue, you know, here in the Southern California Conference. So thank you so much for opening your doors. Thank you for the invitation and having me here today. Uh, matters of the heart. You know, I, you know, he asked me when we were sitting here, he goes, are you going to be talking about your experience? And many of you may not know this, but back in October I was hospitalized because I did have an issue with my heart. And I'll, I'll, I'll interweave, you know, my story here with the, with the sermon. But I feel very blessed because there's many times that the Lord I consider has saved my life. You know, I don't know many of you probably have similar stories, but I have this pattern of different times that the Lord, I feel, or sense has intervened. When I was born, you know, within a few days of being born, I got really sick. Of course, I didn't know that my parents told me this story. And then they take me back to the hospital, and the doctor says, you wait one more day and your son could have died. You know, later when I was about maybe five or six years old, I didn't know how to swim yet. And my dad was doing Bible studies. You know, he, he used to enjoy doing that. I remember we were in this house at a pool. So us kids, you know, when my dad was giving the Bible study to the family, the kids that were there from, from the family and the people that were visiting from the church were playing outside. So we're running around the pool. And you know, you tell kids, don't run around the pool, right? So of course, we're running around the pool, and I fall in the deepest end of the pool. I don't know how to swim. I'm struggling, I remember. But yet, there was a kid there that was just a few years older than me, maybe 10 or 11. He happened to have taken lifeguarding classes. He jumped and rescued me out of the water. You know. Then you fast forward. Just a few years ago, I had an accident that my car was completely totaled. You know, and I had zero injuries. So here I am standing in front of you. And even before that, I had a pulmonary embolism. Yeah, I'm like a, just a story of, you know, incidents. I had a pulmonary embolism, you know, just minor pain in my chest, here on the side of my, my chest. Went to the hospital in the emergency room. The doctor says, we have to admit you. You have something deadly. And I felt so good. Yeah, I had no signs of trouble other than just a little pinch on the side of my, side of my chest here. So most recently, and before I get into the story, I want to leave again, read again Psalms 25, 17. Relieve the troubles of my heart and free me from my anguish. October 20, Saturday morning. I got up because I had an appointment that day. It was when I go preach to different churches. And I got up very early and I happened to be training for a marathon. That's one of the things that I enjoy. And the day before, I had run five miles with no trouble. I had one of the best runs that I've had in a while. So that morning, I got up early. And I said, you know, I'm so early. It was about 6 in the morning. I don't have to be at church until about 9.30. Maybe I'll just do maybe 20 minutes of some exercise, you know, to keep my, keep my routine. So I got up. And then when I got done with the exercise, I felt a little pain on my chest. Right here in the center of my chest. So... You know, I've exercised all my life, I've done organized sports. So you learn to be in tune with your body, and you learn to be in tune with what's normal and what isn't. So then I realized that that pain did not feel normal to me. But even though I just said, well, may go away, you know, it didn't feel too, too strong. So I took a shower, shaved, began to get ready. But now it's been 20 minutes and the pain hasn't gone away. So I, it bothered me a little bit. This is unusual. So I said, I'm going to sit on the bed and I'm going to wait five more minutes and see what happens. So I sat on the bed, five more minutes, the pain would not go away. So now it's 25 minutes of chest pain. So I tell Rachel, that's my wife, she's not here today because she joined a singing group and they're performing to this, so she's also ministering somewhere else, Amen. different church. So I said to, her, I said to her, hey, take me to the hospital because this is not normal. 
So the hospital, fortunately for me, is about a mile away from the house. You know, and I didn't know this, but when I, went, when I got there, the Glendale Adventist Hospital actually has one of the best cardiac units in the country. So praise the Lord for that also. So I get there, I sit in the ER, and I tell the nurse I have chest pain. So immediately they, I hear over the loudspeaker some code. You know, immediately somebody comes in, takes me to the back, they hook me to a machine, and they start monitoring my heart. They start monitoring my heart. Everything in my heart was absolutely normal. My heartbeat was perfect. My vital signs were all normal, and they took some blood samples, and then they did blood samples, whatever they were looking for, was not, was not present in my blood test. Everything perfectly normal. But then by now it's about an hour, so they keep asking me, do you still have chest pain? I say, yes, I still have chest pain. I don't know how about you, but when you go to the hospital, they always ask you to rate the pain. You have that experience? You know, I never know what to say. <laughs> so because I have high tolerance for pain, so you know, it's a little skewed for me. So I tell them it's about a three or a four, I'm not sure. You know, but they kept, said, well, we're going to keep you and we're going to observe you for the rest of today. So they kept taking blood samples, they kept monitoring my heart. My heart was perfectly normal the whole time I was there. But the blood test began to show just a little bit of an enzyme that is called troponin. And if you have any heart issues, you know that when the heart gets injured, it releases this enzyme, and it is by this enzyme that they can measure how bad, how bad the heart is injured. So the second blood test came back at 0.1, you know, just a fraction. And they said, that fraction is enough to know something is wrong, so we're going to keep you all day. And then the next, te- the next test came back at 5, and they said, not 0.5, 5.0. So they said, we're going to keep you overnight for observation. By nighttime, it was 13. And by then, the nurses are freaking out. As a matter of fact, they, you know, I kept asking every time, what's my result? The nurse was so scared, she didn't want to tell me. She said, I cannot tell you. You have to wait for the doctor. I'm not going to talk to you, she said. So I'm there in bed, you know, kind of trying to figure out because I still felt good. I was laying in bed. My heart was normal. Just a minor chest pain that had given me some pain medication, so I couldn't even feel it anymore. So the cardiologist says, he comes and he tells me, it's 13, we have to do a cast procedure in the morning, 8 a.m. I'm going to pause here, because then now, you know, I decided to look in the Bible, the word heart, to see what the Bible has to say about that. So I found in the New International Version, you know, it's nice to them because you can do it electronically, you don't have to read, right, to find it, and I found 509 instances of the word heart in the Bible. And the references go like this. They can go from evil acts, acts of love, acts of transformation, protection, comfort, salvation. All these subjects are covered through the word heart. As a matter of fact, the first time that the word heart is mentioned is in Genesis 6, 5 through 6, and it says the following. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. You know, God's heart, I'm going to call it God was having a heart attack. (laughs) Yes, because he saw that humanity had turned their hearts away from him, and humanity needed an intervention. They needed a cardiologist. The signs of trouble were there, but humanity, the human race, did not know they needed a doctor. As a matter of fact, you know that he destroyed the earth through the flood. We know that happened. But even after that, it says in Genesis 8.21, the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, never again will I curse the ground because of humans. Even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood, and never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. So even though God was having a heart attack, He did intervene, but he still knew that even after his intervention, humanity would not be inclined towards him. He knew that he said that. But even though he knew that, he decided that he was going to continue to suffer for us. He was going to continue to be having that chest pain continually. In spite of the human race. 
So he still chose to have grace and mercy towards us, towards us. And after that, if you keep reading, the Lord constantly kept reminding the people of Israel to remember what he had done for them. He wanted them to remember that he was always intervening on their behalf and that he did not want them to forget our God. But the people of Israel would continually forget our God and that was a sign of trouble. Deuteronomy 4, 9 says the following, Only be careful and watch yourselves closely so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them fade for your heart as long as you live. Teach them to your children and to the children after them. So God, you know, when we decide to follow God, God is interested in us continuing to be invested in our hearts and our minds with Him, and that we do not forget the way that God has intervened in our lives. Mm -hmm. So for me, that's why I like history. Because when I look back, I can always see God's hands in my life. And every time that I feel weak, every time my faith falters, I can go back and remember that God has never left me alone. Have you ever seen that in your life? And when you see it, do you tell other people? Do you continue to remember and tell your kids that God is always present? That's what God wants us to do. He wants us to make sure that we do not forget because the moment that you stop telling the story is the moment that you forget. Doesn't that happen to you sometimes? You know, I I realize one of the things that that I really enjoy that's been difficult for me to do is to remember my life. You know, you heard that I was from Puerto Rico. I was born there and I spent 17 years there. First part of my life. I left, moved to Florida. And then my life after that has been kind of crazy. I've been in a lot of places. Lived in Florida, I lived in Wisconsin, lived in Indiana, lived in Texas, now I'm living in California. But something happens when you move away from the place where you were born, it's hard to have memories. Because you cannot go back and see those places again. So every time I go on vacation, I, I do what I call the nostalgic tour. <laughs> you know, I go back and I drive to the high school that I went to or the elementary school or the house that I grew up in. As a matter of fact, one time I went and I asked the lady, you know, some other people bought the house. And I went, and I went with Rachel at that time. So I, because I wanted her to see where I was born, you know, and where I lived. So we went to the house and I politely lock, knock on the door. It's like a movie. You think this is a movie. It's like people go back and they knock on the door and say, I'm so and so, I used to live here. Okay. I did like that. I went to the house, I knocked on the door, and I said, I'm sorry, I know that you may not know me, but my name is Orville Ortiz, and I was born in this house, and I was raised in this house. Do you mind if I walk into it? (laughs) And the lady, fortunately, was a lady that actually had lived in another house in the same neighborhood, and she goes, oh, I remember you, she said. I know your parents. They sold the house. You were that little boy. I said, yes, that's me. Sure, come on in. We'll let you come in. So they let me come in and watch the house. And all of a sudden, you're flooded with memories, right? When you're in that place at that moment. So it's like that. You got to remember every time what God has done for you so that you're flooded with those memories and your heart is again attracted to the Lord. Amen. It says in Psalm 14.1, it says, The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. Their deeds are, are vile. There is no one who does good. God does not want us to be fools. We know that God exists. We have seen his hand. We have seen the miracles. We have seen the grace. We have seen the mercy. We have seen forgiveness. We have seen transformation. We have seen power in our lives. You know, so finally, it's Sunday. It's it's Saturday, now it's Sunday morning. They take me into the cath lab. I don't know if you're, you know, maybe not all you have had a cath procedure done. So I'm going to tell you what that's like. So they take you in this you know, room, and they have monitors. They have you know, this, this very narrow bed so that the doctor can get very close to you. you know, so when you get in there, they, there's not even room for your hands. So they put these plastic things on the side so that you can rest your arms in these plastic sleeves on the side of the bed. So I'm there. You know, the doctor says, we're going to sedate you so you're awake to the procedure. You're not sleeping. I told the doctor, I said, give me a good sedation. I said, because I have a high tolerance for drugs too. I'm, I don't know what it is about my body that I tolerate drugs, I tolerate pain. One time they gave me morphine and I did nothing for me. <laughs> that's, how, that's how strong my body is. So I told the doctor that, that story. So he told the, the anesthesiologist, you know, pump some extra stuff in there. You know, but even with that, 
the first time, I, have, I had to go twice, just so you know, because I'll explain to you what happened there. But I had to go twice to the cath procedure. But the first time they went in there, they still didn't give me enough so I could feel everything they were doing. You know, and they do this thing where they, they punch a hole near your groin area to find your artery, and then from there they, they do a rotor rooter, is what I call it. So they put a little cable with a camera, and they go, they snake it, you know, through your artery all the way to your heart. On down there. But I could feel everything that was happening down there as they were, you know, trying to stick that in there and, and go through the heart. But the doctor then gets there with his camera. Can you switch the slide, please? Next one. Thank you. <clears throat> so when he gets in there, you see that yellow color artery? That is called the left descending artery. Also referred to as the widow maker. So when the doctor gets in there, he finds that I have a blood clot. It was so big, this clot, that was creating 100% occlusion of the left descending artery. As a matter of fact, statistics show that when somebody has 100% occlusion of the left descending artery, cardiac arrest can take place within 10 to 20 minutes of no circulation. And I had 100% occlusion, basically I had no circulation going through the left descending artery. I was a walking dead man. Have you ever heard that show, The Walking Dead? I was like that. But yet, I did not know it. I didn't know it. I just told you that the whole time that they were monitoring my heart, my heart was what? Beating normal. As a matter of fact, when they told me that I couldn't get up from the bed the night before, I said, you cannot get up anymore. They were so scared. I said, you cannot get up. You are limited to bed rest. You cannot get up anymore. That's it for the rest of the night. That was a Saturday night. I was like, but I feel fine. Why can I not get up? I was walking there. The face of the doctor, I saw his face when he saw that. His face, his countenance completely changed. He walked up to me, he put his hand in my shoulder, and he says to me, this is very serious. He says, I don't understand how you're even walking, talking, and your heart is still beating normal. 100% occlusion. As a matter of fact, he got so scared, he said to me, I cannot finish this procedure today. He said, the clot is so big. Because he also found out that my arteries are clean. So praise the Lord for that. <laughs> yeah, I had no, no plaque buildup, nothing in my arteries or veins. He, because we know when they go through there, they can see everything. He said, you have nothing, you're so clean. You're such a healthy man, he said. You know, that's, a, that's another sermon for a health message. <laughs> I'm not going to talk about that today. But he said, you're such a healthy man, he says. He says, so I don't understand. I said, we're going to have to stop right now, and we're going to have to come back tomorrow because I need to have a different game plan. Because he thought that he would go in there. He thought that I had a little bit of plaque buildup in my heart. He said, I'm just going to go in there, put a stent, and we're done. That's what he thought. But he found this deadly condition when he got in there. Sometimes we are also the walking dead. <laughs> Deuteronomy 439 says the following. Acknowledge and take to heart this day that the Lord is God in heaven above and on the earth below. There is no other. Sometimes we forget that God is greater than us. And the moment that we forget that God is greater than us, we become the walking dead. Because the moment that you do that is the moment that you begin to reject God's intervention in your life. He wants to perform that calf procedure. He wants to be that doctor, but you will not let him. As a matter of fact, it says in Deuteronomy 6, 5 through 7, it says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give to you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. In other words, there could be no moment in your life that you give in consideration to God in your life. Now, what is the worst thing that can happen to you? He says, Deuteronomy 8.14, if you forget to do these things, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God. If you remember, pride was got Satan in trouble. 
Don't let your heart be proud. Do not forget God in your life. And think that you can function without God in your life. When we become proud, all the deadly signs are there. It's like taking a blood sample. Your heart's still beating, and it feels normal. Everything is fine, but when you begin to take that blood sample and you begin to look for that enzyme, this is what you find. Maybe you have stopped praying. Maybe you have stopped seeking God's advice in your life. Maybe you have stopped reading the Bible. Maybe you have stopped filling yourselves with the thoughts of God and the desires of God for your life. But you're still functioning, so it feels like everything is normal. There is no trouble. But that's when we become the walking dead and we become like a time bomb waiting to explode out of God's presence. We hate his influence over our lives and we do not want to admit that we are in danger because we feel good. You know, when I was in the hospital, I told you that I could never tell that I was a walking dead because all my EKGs were normal. Everything kept working normal. My oxygenation levels, something else that happens when you have a, a occlusion, your oxygenation levels drop. I was still hitting 98%, 99%. But I still had a deadly condition that required intervention. If we reject God's intervention, this is what he says. Deuteronomy 28, 65 to 66. Among those nations, you will find no response, no resting place for the sole of your foot. There the Lord will give you an anxious mind, eyes weary with longing, and a despairing heart. You will live in constant suspense, filled with dread, both night and day, never sure of your life. You know, one of the things that I discover is that whenever, you know, in, in, in the journey of Christianity, in the journey of this intimate relationship with God, you know, we have these up and downs sometimes, right? And there are times that we may have forgotten to keep God involved in our lives. And I don't know about you, but what I discovered in those times is I don't feel at peace. You know, sometimes when you read that, it says that he will give you. And that troubles me sometimes. Because is God going to intentionally do this to me? But I remember I had a, a professor uh, in one of our colleges at Southwestern Adventist University because when you read the story of Pharaoh and the people of Israel, it says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And he, you know, so a student asked a question, he says, this, was God doing this intentionally? Did he do that to Pharaoh? And the teacher had an excellent response. It's the best response that I personally have ever heard. And he said, well, the sun comes out every day, correct? Yes, it does. Now, have you ever seen what happens to the sun when it hits the mud? It dries up. But when the sun hits the snow, it melts. So it's the same sun, it's no different, but it has different effect depending on what the object that is hitting. So he's saying God is not making you intentionally harden in your heart, but that's the effect that it has in our heart when our heart is turned away from God. So we can be either like the snow, that we can melt, or we can be like the mud and hardened. So we have to continue the counsel of the doctor of doctors. It says in Proverbs 3, 3 through 8, Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your paths straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. So finally, my friends, the doctor went in there the second day. By now it's Monday morning. And he was able to successfully remove the clot from my heart. Of course, in the interim, they had to give me a lot of medication. They have what they call uh, clot-busting medication that they injected directly into my heart. I forgot to tell you that the first time. And there's nothing more painful than that, let me tell you. Yeah, because they're adding volume, you know, to your to your heart, and also that clot is there blocking, you know, the artery. So then that vo- added volume also, you know, hits that clot. So the doctor said to me, "It's going to be painful when I do this." And when he did, I remember I told you about those plastic plastic sleeves. So I was grabbing them so hard, you know, I was super tense like this because it was so painful. 
And the doctor said to me, relax, he yelled at me. And I said to him, I can't. <laughs> and then he said, you have to, he says. And he said, I know it's painful. And then I, I didn't say this, but this is what I wanted to say. No, you don't know how painful this is because you never had it done. <laughs> but I tried my best to you know, open my, open my, my arm, my hands, my fingers stretch to relax because he you know, told me that I needed to relax. So I tried. <clears throat> But sometimes I was thinking, when God intervenes, it's like that. Oh my gosh. When God intervenes in our life, sometimes it can be so painful and you want to clench and you say, I don't want this treatment. It's hurting me. And God says, relax. I'm here for you. You are going to get better. Just wait for the other side. My friends, I can tell you that I am a lot better now. Claude was gone. He showed me a picture of the clot. So they removed it. Took a picture for me. It's pretty big. But now, you know, praise the Lord. You know, he told me, the doctor said to me, you're so healthy, your, your heart will bounce back. He said. They measured and they figured out that I had lost about 10% of function while the clot was still in there. But in my follow-up visits, you know, the doctor and I were even talking about exercise programs. And there's a program called Insanity. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. <laughs> you know, and the doctor says to me, oh, you're doing Insanity? Let me show you an even harder program, the doctor says. Because you're getting so healthy, you can do it. You know what? That's what God wants to do for us. The heart seems to fail, loses function when it's away from God. But when God intervenes again in our lives, you know, you get healthy again, and you can do more than you thought you could ever do. As a matter of fact, that takes me to Psalm 25, 17. Relieve the troubles of my heart and free me from my anguish. And Psalm 13, 5 through 6, it says, But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. And I'm going to now give you the final clincher. Ask God to perform heart surgery on you. Ezekiel 36, 26. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and I will give you a heart of flesh. Amen. Trust the Lord in your life, my friends. Amen. There is no better friend. God bless you. Amen. Amen.